that in Canada there is um, uh, both the media and government are look, reaching out to academics to actually engage in public debate. Um, when you think about Brexit and, develop, and the experience of a lot of academics in the UK, particularly those who are developing a counter-narrative to that of the government, our experience has been very, very different. Now, in terms of public engagement, the public academic, um, in the UK we have this thing that is called the Research Excellence Framework, and a large part of the funding that is allocated to universities now is not just on the quality of the research outputs, the work that we produce, but also on impact. And, and that is defined as impact on society, government, the economy. Is, it's actually a key performance indicator. I do understand that that's not a uniquely British experience, um, but it really positions our, ourselves as academics in a particular way within the neoliberal university. Having said that, for those of us who have been involved in commenting on Brexit, uh, to actually think about the repercussions and implications of Brexit for, for the UK and for the EU more generally, it's not been an easy climate to work in and to actually produce research and to engage in public debate. Um, if you've not been in the UK, where well, you might be familiar with uh, Michael Gove's statement, Britain has had enough of experts. Uh, so there's actually been a concerted campaign against the delegitimization of expert knowledge and expertise in the context of, of this very public debate. It doesn't help when academics jump into the discussion, perhaps a little bit too prematurely, making predictions, promising to eat their book on live TV, and then following through with it. I'm not entirely sure that actually helps our cause. Um, but why does it matter? Because we as academics, as we are being encouraged to participate and contribute in public debate, we're often pushing out information in a less nuanced way than we would do in our articles, uh, and perhaps a bit too early than we would like to. And that has repercussions for the quality of the work that we do and that we produce. I would also actually say that this is deeply gendered. Uh, I do work on gender, so that's the lens through which I'm going to look at it. Um, I, did, I did not want to actually do research on Brexit when the referendum started at all, simply because I'm an EU national living in the UK and I thought the whole process was going to come a bit too close to my heart and the impact of it on my own family life, etc. And I actually did not want it to come into my work life as well. The reason why I started doing research on this is because uh, when one of my colleagues uh, was driving, she texts me after nearly crashing a car because she was listening to a program on BBC Radio 4, so a legitimate program, high profile program, in which the reporter said, it's like, oh, we'd like to talk to women about Brexit and the referendum, but there are no women who can speak about this. We can't find women's experts. So big plug to Tony Hustrup here. She uh, led the production of a crowdsource list of women experts who can talk about politics, law, economics, finance, you name it, right? Uh, so actually there are plenty of women who can speak about those kind of issues. However, what was clear during the EU referendum campaign, the media was really not interested. So this is actually something that I'm going to throw back to our, to our editor here. Um, <laughs> bring women in as commentators in terms of symbolic representation, in terms of actually including different voices. So in the context of the EU referendum, uh, colleagues from Loughborough University found that women only counted up to about 17% of the total number of experts or commentators or politicians interviewed or just um, included in stories about the EU referendum. Funnily enough, women up until the day before the EU referendum in 2016 were more likely to say that they were undecided about how to vote. 
After the referendum, we ran a survey, and 10 days after the referendum, women still had a significantly lower level of engagement with EU issues. They felt that their knowledge was much lower than that of men. Now, that's self-perceived knowledge. It's not real knowledge, okay? But if we don't actually um, include women's voices on TV and the press, if we don't actually include critical accounts, then it's very difficult for the uh, full electorate, the broader kind of part of the electorate, to really feel engaged with key issues. Because actually, the women's experience of engagement with the media is fraught with danger. Uh, we all know about the trolling that is taking place, and this is actually something that is unfolding at the moment. It's something that happened at ISA, the International Studies Association Annual Conference, uh, earlier this year. I'm not really interested in thinking about the story, but I'm interested in reflecting upon the way that trolls, the way that the internet, the way that commentators have reacted to the breaking of the story. Because we need to understand that media, and specifically online media, is a deeply gendered space. And there are also good reasons why women may not want to engage in the same way as men. But this is also part of the silencing of women's voices. Talking to other activists on, on Twitter, on social media, etc., one of the reasons why they keep engaging in, uh, in social media activities is because this gives them a voice. And I should add, it's, like it's not trolling by women, but of women engaging in public debate. Now, this is part of the kind of broader environment within which we work and operate. But for those of us researching European Union studies, we're also operating in a very hostile climate. Um, I don't know if um, any of you are aware of what happened in October, September, October last year. Yeah, first, 10th of October last year. Uh, he told Harry, one of the Harris, uh, one of the government whips, wrote a letter to all universities' vice chancellors, asking them to name, to produce a list of everyone who was teaching on EU politics and policies, Brexit, and actually provide the material. Um, it, the news story broke. One of the universities leaked the letter, uh, and then what happened is like, oh. He was researching a book, it turns out. But he contacts the universities on official letterhead papers. So this is, can be seen as a climate in which EU scholars have to contend with, particularly those of us who are funded by the Jean Monnet Action Programme. And I have a few stories to tell about that. Soon after, we have uh, the Daily Mail that breaks out a story alongside it, which uh, was the title of which was Our Remainer Universities. And if you think you know that was bad enough, in the uh, central pages, they actually not just name and shame individuals, but put their pictures in the middle of the newspaper, including their ages. Uh, you know, for starter, you start off with 10, just why every single Oxford head is a lefty. Uh, and then, in the same article, a call on students to report on their academic staff if they feel that their teaching is being biased. People have been reported. People have appeared after this, again, in the Daily Mail. I mean, this is not just academia. This is part of it. The judges are also at the receiving end of it. But it is one of the kind of issues that our institutions need to contend with when we start to encourage academics to actually become public figures. Because in a way, you do that at your own risk. Because the infrastructure there is not yet ready to actually protect uh, academics. Now, there is, I'm gonna end on a positive note, but before that, a little bit more caution. And this is um, what I've learned from my own experience of uh, becoming more of a public figure than I really wanted. Uh, I published a piece on the gendered impact of Brexit, looking at 
the way that the UK government negotiated two core policy areas, women on corporate boards and maternity rights at the European level. And obviously we do not know what's going to happen post-Brexit. All we can do is look back in order to see how different governments negotiate the policies at the European level and therefore uh, set out some expectations of how we think governments will behave in the future. It doesn't paint a pretty picture for the Conservative government. That's the finding. Um, my university produced a uh, press release which was then picked up by Robert Peston who asked in the context of the President's Clubs affair, I don't know if anybody has heard about the President Club, who's not in the UK, it was a big scandal relating to sexual exploitation of young women uh, by senior corporates. Uh, it was broken by all the major media, the Financial Times, etc. So in the context of that, he asked, is Brexit a threat to women's rights? Not an unreasonable question in light of recent events. So let's think about it within the broader context as gender as a structure of power, rather than just a variable, right? Uh, Robert Peston has about one million followers. And oh boy, I, I became quite well acquainted with several of those followers uh, when they started trolling me. So I have uh, this lovely blog written about me, uh, where I'm called the Nutty Professors. What is up? Again, you need to have several drinks before you go and read this stuff. And then they become really interesting if you're a gender scholar. Because what they choose to attack. I would have thought the greatest threat to women's rights comes from growing populations of religions, uh, religious Muslims that leftists like to support and letting in. So deeply racialized. Also, you know, the kind of uh, heteronormative kind of uh, agenda. So what it transpires that it is a very kind of male dominated kind of space in which women have to thread with care. Now would I do things differently? Would I not? Would I tell my university don't bother <coughs> putting in the press release? Absolutely not. And the reason for that is that I've spent two years talking about the potential gendered impact of Brexit. And the fact that the issue of equality does not appear on the radar of anybody talking about Brexit either from the European side or from the British side. There are higher political priorities. We need to negotiate a trade deal. There is issues to do with migration. What about citizens' rights? All of those issues are deeply gendered. And if we don't think about them, we actually marginalize a core sector of the population. So, was it difficult? Absolutely. Did I cocoon for about two weeks? Yeah. Did I develop a bigger armor around me? Yes. Um, are we now instituting policies and measures at my university to actually facilitate engagement, but also protect academics? Because this is not what we've been trained to do to engage publicly, to become public speakers, to become the public face of the university, to actually deal with trolling. Uh, but we're not talking about it. We're not talking about it more than we have done for two years. So if that's what it takes to raise awareness, then fine. But it comes at a cost, a fairly significant cost. So. What my university said to me is like, well, gosh, this has never happened, right? The worst was when one of my colleagues who wrote about fisheries got about three, three trolls uh, writing to him. And I said, well, kind of, we should have expected it because of this, right? Because it was a perfect storm. You have two women authors with foreign sounding names, writing about gender, writing about Brexit, in the context of a storm about the liberal university. Of course it was going to happen. It was a gift to, to certain sections of the press and the media, and certainly to the trolls. But 
there are ways that we can actually address it. So the lessons for this, to all academics who are interested in actually engaging in this kind of public debate, develop your network. So one of the things that we're often told or taught when it comes to trolls, don't engage with a troll. Don't answer. Ignore it, right? Yeah, okay. But that's not good enough. Because when you have a Twitter storm taking place with thousands of trolls and thousands of tweets and people writing about you or going on radio and spelling your name and saying you can go and find her at this university, it becomes very, very difficult. And I have not received the worst of the trolling that is taking place. Far from it. Okay? What you need is to have a counter, counter store, right? So build your networks so if something like this happens, you can have a counter storm, a counter discourse emerging. Particularly because as academics, our universities might like us to engage, but they don't like the bad publicity. So you actually need colleagues, friends, critical friends as well, to engage and say, well actually, you could, you could read, and one of our colleagues uh, tweeted, like, you could read the wonderful article by Marcelo and Garina, readily available here, and by the way, the publishers love it, because the article went open access within about 30 minutes, and it has been open access until the end of last month. Uh, so, so all metrics are wonderful uh, on, on this piece, but at a cost, right? But, or he said, it's like, or you could read the bio under Robert Peston's Twitter feed. Your choice. But here comes with a warning. And that balances it out. And it also makes you feel protected. Because you're also working in that kind of sphere. But you know that you're not the only one, and there is a community around you. So, is it worth it? Yes. But do get the training, and actually think about it before you actually engage with your university and make sure that they have the structures in place to protect you, to support you, and to take you out of trouble if necessary.